Hey, Pretty Girl Club. So today I want to psychoanalyze 50-50 relationships. Um, for those of you who do not know, about 87% of men in the United States make less than $100,000. And even if the man you meet does make $100,000, after taking out like taxes and things like that, he's only going to end up making around $77,000 per year, which is about $6,400 per month. So if you're going into a relationship or a marriage with a man who makes $6,400 per month and you are expecting him to be a full-on provider and you're expecting to have this hypergamous dream marriage, I'm not trying to shatter anyone's dreams. I'm just trying to open your eyes to reality because I have noticed the, uh, the trad wife uh, trend online. I don't really... I'm, I'm not going to like bash it or anything like that. If that is your goal, that's totally fine. Um, here on this channel, I don't have like any biases or look down on certain relationships. I don't care if you're a wife, if you're a single mom, uh, friends with benefits, sex worker. That is not what I'm worried about. What I want is for women to avoid as many traumas as possible. So when it comes to the whole trad wife thing, have you ever noticed that there are never any trad wives over the age of 50? There are never trad wives over the age of 60 or 70. I don't see that trend. Like where is that trend? If you look at the child free trend, if you go online, you will see posts of women who are in their 60s and 70s saying that they have been child free and they don't regret it. If you join the celibacy trend or you become kind of like a spinster or you decenter men and you decide not to date and you just decide to um, kind of stay single, you will find elderly women who are just like that and who are happy. But I've noticed that with trad wives, I don't see any older women who are like 60 and 70 years old, both on or offline, who talk about how fulfilling it is to have been married for that long. As a matter of fact, even if I look at women who are in regular 50-50 marriages, if I ask them, hey, how did you stay married for 30 years? How did you stay married for 40 years? Usually the woman will respond and say, oh, you know, I was with him from the very beginning when he had nothing. Or the man will uh, respond and he will say things like, yeah, she was with me when I was an alcoholic. She was with me when I had no job. She was with me when I was abusive. So a lot of these marriages that last for a long time, these are not marriages where the woman was just lavished in luxury and where she was so spoiled and cared for. Oftentimes, there are a lot of married women who will spend the rest of their lives still living in poverty or still being middle class at best. So imagine being in a 50-50 relationship. Your wealth isn't even growing. He didn't treat you right for the first 15 years of the marriage. But guess what? You get to tell everybody else that you were married for 30 years. And also, if you look at the trends, like even if you just go on Reddit or you just ask your own friends and family members who have been married for a long time, um, if they say that they're happy, usually the woman will say the reason she's happy is because she got through the hard times. Has anyone else ever noticed that? Like one of the overarching themes that I've noticed amongst older women, like senior age women who stay married their entire lives, is they will say, we made it through the trials, you know, we made it through all the hills and the valleys, and I'm just glad that I stuck around because now he's finally emotionally available. Um, it took him 20 years to learn how to really listen to what I need, but now we're finally on the same page. But it's like, why am I expected to wait 10, 15, and 20 years for a man to finally listen to me? Why is it that I have to put in all this emotional effort or go through 15 years of turmoil just so the final five years of the marriage can be a good marriage? One of the overarching themes I've noticed with older senior age women who are married is that they will talk about how they went through basically the first 10 or 15 years were hell, the next five years were like mediocre at best, but then the final 10 years or like, you know, 10 years after that, then it was fantastic. And it's like, why do I have to give up 30 years of my life just to get to a point where I'm finally happy in a relationship? What a lot of people don't realize is this is actually the norm for a lot of married couples who have been married for a long time. My parents have been together since, I don't know, since before I was born. They have been together since they were like 14 and 17 years old. Another thing that people don't talk about is the potential for grooming. So like, I'm not saying that my dad did that to my mom, but for a lot of people whose parents have been together for decades, like my parents, 
maybe your mom and dad met when, you know, your mom was 18 or 19 years old, or they got married very young and they stayed married for 50 years. Part of me wonders if, you know, if those women who have been married for that long, if they would have had some time to be single after high school, if they would have had time to go to college and maybe build some wealth for themselves, would they still have been married to the man that they are with to this day? Because one thing I've also noticed is that the, the wealthier a woman is, actually there are also articles to back this up, usually the wealthier a woman is and the more educated she is, the less likely she is to get married or the less likely she is to stay married because that woman has more options. She has more options to leave because she is smart, you know, she's got other things going for herself and she has other sources of happiness other than a guy. But one thing I've also noticed about a lot of marriage dynamics is there seems to be a lot of codependency. Because if you ask a man how he knows that he loves his wife, oftentimes he will start naming things that she does for him or he will start describing codependency. Let's look up the definition of codependency. It says that codependency is excessive emotional or psychological reliance on a partner, typically one who requires support on account of an illness or addiction. So let's talk about addictions because a lot of men actually do have very addictive behaviors even though they don't want to admit it. A lot of men are actually addicted to things like pornography and video games. How many of you guys know someone who is married to a video game addict or a porn addict and oftentimes if you bring this up to the man like hey you're addicted to these things oftentimes he will say things like well can't we just work through it or aren't you supposed to just support me? That by definition is codependency. And don't even get me started on the men who are sex addicts who like to go out and cheat all the time and then they'll say the same thing to their wives. Can't we just work through this? Can't you support me through this? Once again, look at the screen. Look at the definition of codependency. It is someone who expects support in the midst of an addiction. Someone who expects you to stay with them. They don't expect you to leave them. They just expect you to stay with them and deal with whatever um, addiction they're going through. Also, um, it says that the definition of codependency is also typically one who requires support on account of an illness. How many men do you know who are expecting their wives to take care of them when they are ill? But isn't it interesting that studies also show that um, a lot of men, they will leave a woman if she is diagnosed with some sort of terminal illness. Um, oftentimes when a woman is the most physically vulnerable is actually when a guy will go out and cheat. And this is why pregnancy um, that's a common time for a lot of men to cheat because not only does he have to care for you because your body, you know, your body is fighting for its life and it's fighting to create life. So that is similar to an illness or you may have swollen ankles or like morning sickness. So you're kind of ill naturally, like for nine months. Um, not only is that a common time for men to cheat, but when you're pregnant, you are also not physically attractive to your spouse or to your boyfriend. Um, and when I say not physically attractive, I'm not talking about your face. I'm just talking about your body. I personally have never heard a man say, I really want a woman who has a really big stomach and looks like she's nine months pregnant. Oh, wow, that's so attractive to me. So the attractiveness level does go down when a woman is pregnant. So that does make your relationship very vulnerable. And there are plenty of articles that show that a lot of men, they won't be there to care for you in illness, but they expect you to care for them in their illness, which is actually a part of the definition of codependency. So now that we have established that most, if not all marriages require codependency in order to last, why don't you in the comment section name one person that you know of who has been married for 30 years where there was no codependency in that relationship whatsoever? I'll wait. And by the way, I'm not trying to diss anyone. I'm not trying to throw shade. Obviously, my parents are married. Um, you know, if you struggle with codependency, you can get help. But I have noticed that that tends to be a pattern. So whenever people conflate marriage and love, that's all I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to help you to not conflate marriage with love because they are two different things. Let's dig a little bit deeper into what codependency is. It says it's a tendency to do more than your share all the time. 
Um, most 50-50 relationships are like this because you can't go 50-50 on a baby. Um, the orgasm gap exists, so you're never going to be equal in terms of, you know, the, the amount of orgasms you get from sex with that man. Um, he's going to be having more orgasms than you, so that's not going to be 50-50 equitable. Um, as far as your physical attractiveness, men put more pressure on the woman to maintain her attractiveness. Meanwhile, a lot of guys, you know, they'll go bald. They will, like all kinds of things will happen to men. They'll get a beer belly. You know, they will have hairs coming out of their ears and their nose. They will have like their feet smelling bad. So that part of it is not 50-50. The attraction is not 50-50. Not to mention um, monogamy. So the monogamy is not equal because men are not socialized to be monogamous. Some people would even argue that biologically a lot of men are not monogamous. If you um, study animals and stuff like that, I will say that you can find an example of pretty much anything when it comes to studying animals. So I don't tend to only rely on the studies of animals to determine how men behave. But I will say that women are socialized to be a lot more monogamous than men because a lot of men, when they say they love you, men will say that they love you and then still cheat. So this tells me that a lot of men's definition of love, it does not involve monogamy or it does not involve physical monogamy. Men will say that they love you and they will still jack off to other women. They will still solicit OnlyFans girls or go to strip clubs or be sliding into other girls DMs or he's, you know, he's doing all of these things that I consider to still be cheating. Emotional cheating is cheating. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't talk about. And that's something that a lot of married women also don't talk about as well. Um, ask the nearest married person how many times they've been emotionally cheated on by their spouse. Ask somebody you know who's been married for 30 years how many times their spouse emotionally cheated on them. And I guarantee you that woman will go silent because she doesn't want to tarnish her image of the perfect marriage. That's something else that I have noticed with a lot of couples that stay married for a long time. I grew up in the church. I come from a two-parent home, so I've I've been socialized around a lot of married couples. I'm also from the suburbs, so I've been socialized around that whole, you know, house and the picket fence thing and the dog. And one thing I've noticed about a lot of these wives, especially wives to middle to upper middle class men, um, a lot of the wives will spend decades trying to save the image of the marriage rather than actually working on the marriage. And so oftentimes women will be married to straight dusties. Like they will be in straight up hypogamous marriages, straight up 50-50 marriages, but they will try to say to the world like, oh, my husband took me on a vacation or oh, my husband bought me X, Y, Z. Meanwhile, that's the only thing your husband has bought you in the past 10 years. Or, you know, he might've bought you a Louis bag for Christmas, but he just bought his mistress a new car last year. And by the way, that's another thing that I've noticed about 50-50 relationships is a lot of men, they want to convince women to go 50-50 because that man believes that he is the prize. Usually a man that wants you to go 50-50, he doesn't truly believe that you are a prize. And I don't think it's because of your worthiness. I don't like when people make comments like that where they're like, well, you're just not his dream girl. No, it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your desirability. This has everything to do with the way that patriarchy has socialized him. So this is just his view of women overall. It doesn't matter who the woman is. Notice how even famous people like Future and Cardi B and Gabrielle Union and Dwayne Wade, they are still in 50-50 relationships. It has nothing to do with those women like just being low quality or not being like good enough. It has everything to do with that man's mindset on women. But one thing I've noticed about 50-50 men is they seem to not have a problem with providing for their mistress. They don't have a problem buying another woman a drink at a bar. They don't have a problem getting their quote-unquote friend who is a girl. They don't have a problem spoiling her with gifts. They don't have a problem buying other women cars and watches and all types of other things. But suddenly when it comes to the wife, it has to be 50-50. You know why? Because that man is looking for someone to help him build financially. He's looking for someone to help him increase his status. He wants to increase his finances. And he, most of all, wants to increase his desirability in the eyes of other women all on your behalf. And whether he's doing this consciously or subconsciously, I don't know. But so far that has been my theory because I've seen it happen over and over again where once that woman stops providing financially, like once once she stops paying her half of the bills, let's say she's pregnant and she's out of work or something happens and she gets sick, 
a lot of times guys will leave or he will um, he'll leave the marriage or he will cheat or he will start seeking after another woman who can either build him up or he will seek after a woman who he can impress with his money. And by the way, 50% of that money that he now has came from you. Another thing that I've noticed with a lot of 50-50 guys is they want to be able to save money for their mistresses. They want to be able to save money to uh, buy more extravagant things for themselves so that they can go out in society and impress people with their status. This is something that I've noticed so many times where 50-50 guys, um, because he is saving on his bills and stuff, he has extra disposable income to spend on his hobbies. Have you guys ever noticed how on average a lot of men's hobbies are actually just as expensive, if not more expensive than women's hobbies. For example, purchasing very expensive shoes, Yeezys, Jordans, Nikes, whatever. Another hobby that a lot of these guys have, collecting watches. They collect Invicta watches. They collect like all of these Rolexes and stuff like that. Or they have a whole suit collection. If you're from like the Black Baptist Church, oh yeah, those guys, they will spend $500 on a suit. They will spend so much money on their cars. That's another expensive hobby that a lot of guys have. They will have this ugly lemon in their garage. Like it's just a money sucking car. And they will spend all this money on, on parts and like trying to fix it up. Don't even get me started on the men who are into golf clubs and country clubs, guys who are into yachting and going out on their boats, going out sailing. So oftentimes these guys are looking for 50-50 women so that you can then, without realizing it, you're going to become his financial support so that he can go out and explore himself, so that he can go out and find himself. Because one of my other theories is that I actually believe that most men do not have a passion. You know how a lot of us women, we're very passionate about certain things. Generally speaking, if you talk to a woman who is kind of above the age of 25, usually she kind of has a, a pretty good idea of what her passions are. And usually that woman is kind of doing her passions on the side even if she's not getting paid for it usually she's singing in the shower if that's her passion you know she's um, singing karaoke or something or she might be sewing on the side knitting doing crochet but for a lot of guys a lot of guys don't have a sense of passion a lot of guys don't have a sense of purpose like how a lot of women do and this is because guys have just been socialized to basically grow up and get a job and work for a more dominant man you guys have seen my previous videos where I've talked about how most men will spend their lives building the wealth of another man. And by the way, that's another reason why you shouldn't be wasting your time in a 50-50 marriage because it's like, okay, you are, you are spending your time in this 50-50 marriage. Meanwhile, he's going to end up investing more time building another man's wealth, um, kind of being under the thumb of another man who is the boss of him at his company. He's going to be dedicating all of his extra time into maybe getting promoted at that job. So he's putting in all this extra effort for a, for a person he's not married to. Meanwhile, you're at home washing the dishes, cleaning the laundry, letting him look at porn and pretending that you don't notice it wondering who's texting his phone and pretending you don't notice it. You've got all these insecurities about maybe your body, maybe your postpartum body or your gray hairs, your weight gain, whatever it is, you've got all these insecurities and these different stressors on you. Meanwhile, a lot of these guys, they're just utilizing you as a resource. So they're utilizing your money. Um, it's, it's helping him to have more disposable income so he can retire faster or so he can spend money on flashy things so he can go out and not wear his wedding ring when he's out in public and he can go out and hit on women like me at work. Or he will go out and tell other women that he is in the middle of a divorce and it hasn't been finalized yet. Or he will talk about how, you know, your marriage isn't working out or it's dried up. A lot of these guys are also on those dating apps. They have the dating apps for like married men. And don't even get me started on if you have married a businessman. So let's say you've married a guy who makes over 100K. So at that point, now he is probably traveling for work. He's probably going out of town. And we all know what is most likely to happen if a guy is out of town. Most of the time he is going to be maybe cheating or, you know, maybe he's out flirting with his colleagues. You don't know. You have no idea what he's doing. So I'm, I've noticed that a lot of men, they don't want to take these things into account. But here on this channel, because I care about your mental health, those, those are small insecurities that you may be dealing with. Like, wow, he, he just went on this work trip. He hasn't texted me in two days. Or, wow, you know, he didn't call me all night. 
And oftentimes what happens on work trips is these guys will be, you know, sometimes cheating or flirting with a coworker or hiring an escort, hiring sex workers. Another thing that a lot of women don't talk about is those happy ending massage places. A lot of guys go to those types of places that you can find those in any city. You know those massage parlors where you're like, how does this place stay open? Like it just looks like a random rundown house and you just go through the back door. Like why does it look like that? Yeah, usually those are massage parlors for like happy ending massages. And so these are some of the things that people don't want to tell you about. Some some of the things that these wives who have been married for 30 and 40 years, these are the things that they're not telling you about. They're only telling you about the happy part. You know, they're just smiling and posing for the pictures because for them, that's the only time that a lot of these women are happy. And I know it's very sad, but I mean, I guess if, if you like it, I love it. But for a lot of those women, the only happiness they can get is by trying to flex their marriage on you or trying to put down other women. And I just think it's hilarious how a lot of women in long-term relationships and marriages and stuff, they have so much crap to talk about the decentering men movement. And it's like, why is it that happily married women are bashing what life choices single women want to make? That just doesn't make sense. Like if you're so happy in your relationship, why are you even on the internet worried about what single women are doing or worried about how single women are living our lives? But another thing that I've noticed though, um, besides the whole most marriages being 50-50 thing is even if you start off hypergamously, like let's say he makes 200k you know let's say you get lucky you meet the top 10 percent or whatever and uh he makes 200k a year you make like 60k a year and he starts off whining and dining you taking you out this is a method that a lot of men use they will start off by investing a lot in you in the beginning so when he wants to get you to be his girlfriend he's going to take you out everywhere you know once you are um, boyfriend and girlfriend or engaged he's taking you on trips he's flying you everywhere you guys are going on all these vacations and then once you get married it starts to decline so instead of going on a date once a week now it's once every two weeks and then it becomes only once a month and then it becomes once every three months and then you only go on vacation once a year and then gradually he starts kind of complaining about how He's not meeting his financial goals because he has to pay for you or he's not meeting his savings goals. He wants to retire early. And so suddenly he wants to use the marriage as kind of this way to almost manipulate you into contributing more financially. I've seen this happen so many times where guys will try to say, oh, we're a team. But usually when the guy says we're a team, what he really means is we are a team and I am the captain. And so these are the types of guys who they will try to reel you in. And this is why a lot of women, you know, they will get sucked into these marriages because it will start off being amazing. This is why they call it the honeymoon phase, because in the first year of the relationship, it's amazing. But then as the relationship goes on and gets more serious, usually the guy is going to start asking for more and more effort from the woman. And so this is why it's never actually a 50-50 relationship. And in my opinion, even the hypergamous marriages do end up kind of being like a 50-50 type of thing because you're still doing all the work at home. You know, you're still doing half of the labor. It just isn't the financial part of it. You're just doing everything else. And like I said, if you like it, I love it. But one thing that a lot of women don't take into consideration is the emotional labor. So when I use the term emotional labor on this channel, what I'm talking about is you know, you just saw him looking at some other girls on Instagram and now you're trying to calm your anxiety. You're trying to soothe yourself. That is a form of emotional labor. You you found out he's texting his ex. You know, he's still texting uh, one of his baby mamas. He's texting his ex fiance or he's texting some, some high school sweetheart or a girl from college. You just saw on his Facebook that she was messaging him happy birthday or, you know, they're kind of being flirty with each other, sending each other pictures and stuff. And so now your mind is racing with all of these thoughts of, is he still in love with her? Does he really love me? Am I just his financial, you know, kind of like this ATM machine or his financial support and he's just saving up money so that he can go and live his best life once he retires? By the way, that's usually what happens. Um, they call it the midlife crisis. So oftentimes men will get with a woman, they'll get into these 50-50 relationships. That man will think that if he uses this woman for all of her labor or if she loves him enough, then he's going to be happy. But then around middle age, he realizes, oh, my wife's not good enough for me. Usually this is because 
the woman has aged, you know, all of the excitement is gone because a part of the excitement of a relationship is the mystery. It is not seeing her without her makeup on, you know, like you're um, not seeing her in the house with like her house slippers on or she's gained all this weight. So oftentimes the midlife crisis really is just that man realizing that he was never happy his whole life or, you know, realizing that his whole life was just boring. And that includes his own wife. And so this is where you get those 50 and 60 year old men who once they've built up a little bit of wealth, partially because of that wife, he will take that retirement money and go chase after sugar babies. He will go, you know, spend it at the strip club. He'll go uh, start a gambling habit, spend it up in Las Vegas, which is still selfish. And that's another thing. A lot of women have the bar so low to the point where they think that if a man hasn't physically cheated on her, then suddenly he's an angel. And it's like, well, what the heck? Like, no, my, my standards are not that low to where it's like, oh, as long as you don't cheat on me, I'll stay. Like, no, I don't want someone who's an emotional liability. So if you are causing emotional stress and emotional turmoil in my life on a repeated basis for 35 years, that is still not a healthy relationship. But a lot of women do put in way more emotional labor because they are thinking about, you know, oh, why is he texting his friend that's a girl or you know why is he um he he joined this new rowing group and there's this girl on his rowing team who is like really beautiful and you know he really likes hanging out with her all the time and I noticed that he's never invited me to go rowing with him he's never inviting invited me to go kayaking with him but he's constantly going kayaking with his female friend so all of those thoughts that you have in your head and all of this um, anxiety that you have to soothe on a consistent basis that is emotional labor and then if you confront your boyfriend or husband about it, like, hey, I don't like when you're texting your friend that's a girl all the time, or I don't like that you're hanging out with this girl, you're FaceTiming her all, all the time. And then when he tries to argue back and forth and defend himself, that is another form of emotional labor. You trying to convince him to find you valuable enough to give up whatever other women are in his life. You know, that's another form of emotional labor, having to start an argument with this guy because he's not meeting your needs, having to coach him and teach him how to treat you as the relationship is going on. All of that is emotional labor. Having to explain to him and articulate how you feel about him not uh, wanting to contribute to the household or him not wanting to provide for you, you having to constantly explain yourself to him. That is emotional labor. I don't care if the guy is not cheating. If I have to spend my whole life explaining everything I do and explaining every single one of my thoughts for the next 35 years to a grown man who should have emotional intelligence to begin with, that is still not a healthy relationship. I don't care if he never cheats. Too many people focus only on cheating as being the ultimate deal breaker, but there are so many other deal breakers that are just as bad as cheating and being emotionally drained is one of those deal breakers because having constantly high cortisol levels and like constantly having to um, calm your racing thoughts and, you know, going through all this anxiety all the time, that is not good for your physical body. And this is also why there are plenty of articles that talk about how chronic illnesses are actually the most common amongst married women. I see a lot of people talking about that stat that says that unmarried child-free women are the happiest demographic in the world, but a lot of people don't talk about how um, there has been research that shows that women feel more depression and stress after marriage. And so that's something that a lot of people don't talk about. They don't talk about how your risk for chronic illness may increase after marriage because you're going through more stress. You're paying 50% of yours and his bills. And also, let's think about this for a moment. Let's say you're going 50-50 with a guy. Let's say you lived in an apartment and the bills were $1,500. Um, and then you guys buy a house together. And I'm assuming you would want a nice house, right? So let's say you buy a house and the mortgage is about $3,000. So you're going to be paying $1,500 um, to go half on that mortgage. So your expenses have gone up, but so has your stress. So has your emotional labor. So has your sexual labor. And then if you're having children, now you're going to have to go through physical labor to have those children. A lot of people, um, they don't look at pregnancy and like what it actually does to the body and how postpartum depression can happen and stuff like that. So this is a part of why um, there are articles and stuff that talk about how the depression rates tend to increase when it comes to marriage. 
And also, let's talk about therapy for a moment. Have you ever noticed how um, a lot of therapy is marketed towards married couples, like marriage counseling? I don't see anything that says singles counseling or early 20s counseling or, you know, you just got your bachelor's degree counseling. Why is it that therapy, which is intended to help people with mental illnesses, is often marketed towards married women, mothers? It's marketed towards women who have the stressors of taking on other people and taking responsibility for other people. And also, let's think about what marriage counseling really is. Number one, has anyone else noticed that a lot of marriage books are geared towards women? Even if you look at Steve Harvey's book, that wasn't even about marriage, but that book was geared towards women. A lot of relationship books in general are geared towards women only. I don't see an entire market of men who are buying all of these relationship books, um, reading books on how to get a woman, how to keep her happy. But I see plenty of women reading books on how to keep a man. And it's like, if I have to get into a marriage where I literally have to spend the rest of my life reading books, basically brainwashing myself into staying in this relationship, well, that's a sign that it's probably not natural. You know how they say, um, animals have a natural habitat. I believe that you as an individual, you have a natural habitat as well. You have certain areas where you may thrive in life. And it's like, if I have to read all these different books and spend all of this time studying on how to handle his emotions, how to walk on eggshells if he's in a bad mood, if I have to do all of this just to maintain this relationship and it's 50-50, that doesn't sound like it's my natural habitat. That doesn't sound like it's going to help me thrive. Another thing that I've noticed is a lot of people will say, well, no relationship should be 50-50. It should be 100-100. But the woman's version of 100 is usually more than the man's version of 100. Let's just be honest here. Women, on average, add a lot more value to a man's life than what the man can offer a woman. And this is why a lot of women are starting to refuse to get into these 50-50 relationships because women are actually recognizing their value. They're like, wait, I have the power to birth children. I have the power to give you orgasms and stuff, yet you don't really have the same power to give me the same level of orgasms. You don't have the power to birth my children. I have the power to validate you amongst men, increase your status. Um, there are plenty of articles on how husbands and fathers, they tend to get promoted at work and stuff like that because society views them as more trustworthy and more like upstanding. Think about all of the most powerful positions in the world. Presidents, politicians, um, CFOs, CEOs. Usually these men are married. A, a lot of times they also have children as well. And this is because society rewards married men. Society rewards married men with children. And so women are starting to realize, wait a minute, I am bringing more value into the man's life simply by existing here. Forget all of the random soft skills that women have to learn. Like, we as women often bring a lot of nurturing to a relationship. Oftentimes women have more caregiving and like nursing skills because we grew up babysitting and playing house and playing with dolls. So we know how to change diapers. Like I don't have kids, but I know how to change diapers. In fact, I've changed plenty of diapers throughout my life. And I'm sure that the same can be said for a lot of women who are big sisters or you're a big cousin or, you know, you, you know how to babysit, you know how to cook, you know how to be nurturing. Women are also socialized to be more forgiving and empathetic. Notice how whenever a man is looking for empathy, he doesn't turn to another man. He turns to a woman. He will call his mom if he's looking for empathy. He'll call his sister. He will call a female friend. Sometimes he'll even call an ex-girlfriend. And he will look to his wife. And this is because women, on average, tend to exhibit way more empathy than men and emotional support. So this is why... Even if it's 100-100, the woman's 100 is going to be way more valuable than a man's 100. Because the average man doesn't even have the vocabulary to articulate how he feels. And this makes him more of an emotional liability. Um, this is also why oftentimes the woman in the family, she is often the one that is kind of like the glue that holds the family together. Notice how when mom dies or when grandma dies, all the family gatherings stop. 
because usually the women are the ones who are holding families together. The women are the ones who are planning the Christmas dinner. They're planning the get togethers. They're planning Mother's Day and Father's Day. They're planning the funerals. They're cooking at all the funerals and stuff. Women are the ones who are remembering the birthdays. They're remembering all the special holidays. They're telling the husband, hey, call your mom. Hey, call your son. Call your brother and check on him. Women are the ones who are the glue that holds the community together. So whatever community she's in, whether it's her family, whether it is, you know, her and the husband, oftentimes women will also act as mediators for their husband. So let's say your husband doesn't get along with his brothers. He doesn't get along with his sister or his mother. Women will be out here acting as an arbitrator and a mediator for family issues. So these women are out here acting as full-on family therapists. And don't get me started on if you have any knowledge at all on psychology or sociology or if you have any medical knowledge whatsoever. Now this guy is getting a free nurse. He's getting a free medical assistant. He's getting a free caregiver or a free therapist just by having you in his presence. And men on average, they do not bring this many soft skills into a relationship. And this is because of the way that society socializes men. Because remember, patriarchy hurts men as well. So it actually sets up men to have a disadvantage because society tells men, hey, all you have to do is just go to work and just make as much money you can at this company, try to move up at XYZ company over the next 20 years, and then your whole life will be set. Well, no, this is just a lie that rich men tell to poor men so that they can get these men, these poor and these middle class men, to work at these rich men's companies. So these men, they will grow up having spent their whole life going to college or getting a doctoral degree, getting his law degree, getting his business license, doing whatever so that he can make all this money. He didn't spend his time developing emotional intelligence. He didn't spend his time learning how to cook and clean and learning how to overcome porn addictions, learning how to overcome video game addictions. A lot of men, they don't spend their time on stuff like that. And this is because um, society has socialized men to not value emotional intelligence. Society has socialized men to not value being nurturing and being caring and being loyal and faithful. In fact, our society has trained men to be hyper competitive. So that's another thing about 50-50 relationships. Eventually, it may end up turning into a hypogamous relationship if the woman is very ambitious. Because women, on average, are so amazing at multitasking. That's one thing I've noticed about women. We are very good at multitasking. We're very good at um, being flexible and taking on all these different roles and wearing 25 different hats because that's how you are socialized as a woman. So if you're also a smart woman, you are more likely to increase your career. Like I've seen women literally have two jobs, three jobs. They'll have a day job and then they'll have a night job on the side, like doing their own business. They'll be making pies and stuff on the side. They'll have a catering business on the side. They'll purchase their own food trucks on the side. And so, again, this whole narrative that men are natural protectors and providers and builders, show me one man that has been able to build, build himself up and he's self-made and he never had the help of a woman. Jeff Bezos had the help of a woman. Elon Musk had the help of a woman. Steve Jobs had the help of a woman. A lot of the guys who were like geniuses and stuff in the past, a lot of those guys actually died poor. And part of it is because those guys, they didn't have a woman that was also investing her time into him, investing her money into him, going 50-50 with him and all that kind of stuff. Even for those of you who are religious, they will even teach you in Christianity that a woman is a helpmate or she's a man's helpmate and that your whole purpose is to help a man. But this also implies that men need our help and that if we refuse to help them, that they will inevitably fail or stall or they will only hit a certain glass ceiling because they don't have that woman there who is pushing him further. And by the way, this is also why a man will ask you to go 50-50 in the first place. It's because he can't afford the lifestyle that he actually wants to live. He needs a woman to help him pay for that lifestyle that he actually wants. But one thing I've noticed is that even if a man starts off providing, a lot of times the dynamic in a marriage is, he will start off providing 100%, like to get her to be his girlfriend. He'll take her on all these dates. Um, as the engagement and the relationship goes on into a marriage and stuff, gradually most men will start getting comfortable. You know, they'll be like, okay, I got her now. Especially once a woman gets pregnant or she moves in with him 
or she signs that marriage document, this is when the mask starts to fall off for a lot of guys, hence why a lot of men are so desperate for marriage to this day. And also for the people who say 50-50 is an equal partnership or it's bringing equality, equality does not exist, okay? So let's go ahead and get that out of the way right now. Um, I don't know what society you think you're living in, um, but life is not fair, equality does not exist. There is no such thing as you're 100% equal to everybody else 100% of the time. No, certain people have privileges, and guess what? This includes in a marriage as well. So that's, that's why I don't support 50-50 because it's never actually 50-50 because Perfect equality does not exist. Perfection does not exist. Equality does not exist. So why should I get into a relationship where it is the illusion of 50-50 when in reality, I'm putting in the emotional labor. I'm the one who's probably spending money on sexy lingerie and you know I'm spending time looking up how to please a man. That's another thing, even when it comes to sex. A lot of women, we will spend time trying to get our bodies in shape, you know, buying cute and sexy like little underwear and stuff like that and looking up articles and reading Cosmopolitan or whatever, learning how to please a man in the bedroom. Uh, men aren't doing that on average. They're not reading entire articles on how to please a woman. The average man doesn't even know where the clit is on a woman. So that is not equality. That's not sexual equality. The orgasm gap, that is not equality. That's not 50-50. Childbirth is not 50-50 because only the woman has to deal with the pregnancy and all of the risk that comes with it and all of the health consequences afterwards. So that's not equality. So this whole lie that they're telling that, oh, if it's 50-50, that means it's equal. Or if it's 100-100, that means that it's equal. You're, bo you're both um, having equity in the relationship. No, that's not real. That's not how society works. Sorry, but we're not living in a utopia. Um, no, this is not an equal society. And another thing I've noticed is that people in 50-50 relationships, they will say, I want a 50-50 relationship, but like you shouldn't keep score. And it's like, okay, so then you want a 50-50 relationship, but I can't keep score. Well, that already tells me that you're trying to scam me then from day one. Oh, it's supposed to be 50-50. Oh, it's supposed to be 100-100. Oh, but no one's keeping score though. That's an oxymoron. You just contradicted yourself. And of course you don't want me to keep score because you already know that the score is going to be uneven in your favor and it's going to be screwing me over in the end. So of course 50-50 guys are going to say, oh, nobody should be keeping score. It's just 100-100. But then they never tell you what the 100-100 is. Like, have you ever noticed, this is another thing I've noticed about a lot of men. Um, whenever they make promises to women and they say, hey, we're going to get married and stuff, a lot of guys, they don't actually draw out what marriage is going to look like with him. And thankfully, women are getting smarter and we're starting to realize, wait a minute, whatever lifestyle he is living right now, that's going to be my lifestyle. So if he's living in an undecorated house or you know he has like a crusty ass car or something like that, or he doesn't know how to cook, he doesn't know how to clean, he doesn't know how to, I don't know, do his taxes or whatever, um, all of that stuff, that's going to become your lifestyle. If he only shops at Walmart 24-7, he only shops at like cheap stores 24-7, but then you like to go to luxury stores, you like to go to nice restaurants and stuff. Usually when people get into marriages, you don't just, the guy doesn't just suddenly level up out of nowhere. No, usually one person ends up dragging the other one down, whether that's emotionally or financially. And also another thing about the whole money thing, just because a guy makes 100K or 200K, you don't even know what his spending habits are. That is something that you won't discover until you are having shared finances, which is in a marriage. First of all, I think it's absolutely insane marrying someone where like you can't see their bank statements or anything. I personally would not feel safe doing that. But on average, you, you haven't even seen this guy's bank statements. You don't know this guy's spending habits. So you won't even find out about that stuff until you get married. So you could be happy as can be. And then you find out on the honeymoon that his spending habits are insane or that, you know, he's got a whole bunch of credit card debt or he has a secret credit card. By the way, I'm speaking from experience on things like this where, you know, sometimes a guy would have like a secret credit card or you don't realize until you start combining finances what his actual spending habits are. So at that point, the money doesn't even matter because it's like if you make 200K, but then you're in debt, 300K, you are literally broker, you're $100,000 broker than a homeless man on the street. 
And so that is something else that a lot of women don't take into consideration. Oftentimes women will see the house or the cars or the guy will say his income, but it's like, okay, that, that might be your income on paper. But first, first off, let's take out the taxes. Okay. So after the hundred K is gone, you know, it's about 75 K or somewhere around there. So you're making around $6,000 a month. Okay. So now how much debt do you have? How much is your car payment? How much, how much interest do you have on your credit cards? And something else that a lot of 50-50 women don't realize is that oftentimes your man, even though he's going 50-50 with you, he's probably providing for someone else. So he's providing for his mom on the side. He's providing for his children, your stepchildren, on the side. Or he he's providing for his ex, a baby mama. She can text him anytime and say, hey, I need $500 for Johnny. I need $1,000 for Johnny. I need $2,000. And he's providing for her on the side and you don't even know. You're going 50-50 with him. Or maybe he's sending his sister or, you know, other people money that you don't know about. Maybe he's going to a bar and he sees some hot bartender. He tips her 500 bucks. When was the last time he gave you 500 bucks randomly? And so that's what I'm talking about when I say emotional labor. It's going through the thought process of, wait a minute, where does this guy's money actually go? That's a form of emotional labor. And yes, that is tiresome and exhausting to have to think about stuff like that as a woman. And so part of decentering men is not centering their dating standards. Of course, men want 50 50. Well, that's because it benefits them more. But as a part of my decentering men journey, I I no longer revolve my life around what benefits men more. I am now centering my own dating standards. And then people say, you're going to die alone with the cat. I'd rather die alone than die inside. And then people are like, oh, you're just going to be lonely. Okay, being lonely is still better than being miserably married for the next 50 years or being in this horrible relationship where I'm paying 50% and then he's giving money to women on OnlyFans. He has like a, a special porn subscription or something like that. Like I had a friend who she had a boyfriend. She was living with her boyfriend and they had joint finances and she kept seeing money come out of the account for like cable. Um, it was like a part of the cable or something. And then she found out that her boyfriend was taking part of their money, their quote unquote 50-50 or 100-100 joint bank account money, he was spending part of it on random women online who don't even give a fuck about him. So that's my thing. It's like, okay, I'm paying 50%. Meanwhile, he's spending his 50% simping over other women online. And it's like, okay, so those women are are winning then. Those women who are the sex workers and the OnlyFans girls and the actresses and all these women who are kind of decentered from men, they're not in these 50-50 marriages, those women are actually winning then because they're still getting the male gaze, they are still getting male dollars. And so what was the point of me investing all of this special effort if I'm not going to even be treated special in return? A lot of women get into these long-term relationships and marriages because they think that He's going to treat me special forever. And that's why he's marrying me because, you know, he's going to love me forever. He promises to do X, Y, Z forever. When in reality, that's not the case. A lot of men, they are looking for marriage so that they can have some sort of um, financial stability or increase their finances or he, he wants a free womb. You know, he wants to pass on his genes and have children. And of course, you're going to be the default parent for those children. He just gets to go brag and say, hey, I'm a dad. I'm a girl dad. I'm a boy dad. So oftentimes you are going to be kind of the domestic laborer and you're going to end up being a servant, building him up financially Meanwhile, he's out here living his soft life because now, you know, he gets to save an extra 50% of his income and he got it for a discount. So he got a maid for a discount. He got some free sex work for life as a discount and he gets a soft landing so that, you know, when he goes out in public and doesn't wear his wedding ring and hits on women at the bar and stuff, he gets to uh, go out there and then when he gets rejected, he's like, hey, at least I got my wife at home. I am also convinced that a lot of couples who have been married for 30, 40, and 50 years, they are not in love in a romantic sense. Oftentimes those marriages are really just kind of like 50-50 friends with benefits roommates. And it's like, if all you needed was a roommate or friends with benefits, you can do that without having to go through all of the drama of investing all this stuff emotionally being a parent or a step-parent, shuttling kids or stepchildren back and forth from soccer practices, um, acting as a free babysitter if you are a step-parent. 
And also, a lot of men do not take into consideration the amount of sacrifice a woman makes when she gets married, especially if you have pretty privilege. Here on this channel, we talk a lot about pretty privilege and the psychology of beauty and what it's like. So for a lot of pretty privileged women, marriage can actually be a form of trauma because you're used to getting all this attention in society. You're used to guys constantly in your DMs. They're constantly talking to you. They're constantly, you know, doing all these things for you. So you're actually giving up all of the benefits of being a beautiful woman in society because this world worships beauty. The world worships sexiness, desirability, you know, so much so that your own husband is worshiping another beautiful woman right now by jacking off to her. He's thinking about her. He's giving his dick to her. He's giving his money to her at the strip club. So the world worships beauty. So if you are a pretty privileged woman or you have a nice body or whatever, even if your face isn't all that, but your body is banging, you know, you are giving up the benefits of being pedestalized in society as a whole so that you could then stay in the house all the time. You know, no more going to bars, no more taking those pics on Instagram, no more doing any of that because now you're a wife and mother. So you have to stay inside almost as if your house is a prison cell. So you're staying inside all the time, cooking and cleaning. You no longer can spend as much money on beautifying yourself because now you're 50-50. So that man has a say on how you spend your money or he gives you an allowance. You're only allowed to spend whatever he says you're allowed to spend. And so you're giving up this carefree lifestyle of a beautiful woman so you can have kind of almost this unappreciated, invisible labor, the invisible labor that comes with being a wife and mother. So you're going from being hyper visible and pedestalized and treated like a princess by society to suddenly being underappreciated, you know, treated like you're just regular, going 50-50, and basically overlooked. Your man is looking past you so he can look at some bartender. He's looking past you so he can look at OnlyFans. And part of this, I won't even say that men do this maliciously. I think part of it is just because subconsciously, like I said, familiarity can breed contempt. And I've noticed that generally speaking, when you're dealing with men, too much access equals disrespect. It's almost inevitable that if you give a man too much access to you, so living with him, you know, sharing finances with him, sharing everything with him, there's no mystery whatsoever, pretty much you're going to end up being disrespected at some point. If you don't believe me, ask your mom and dad, ask anybody you know who's been married for 50 years, ask her, have you ever been disrespected by your husband? How many times? Like, what happened when he disrespected you? Has he ever cursed at you or yelled at you? I guarantee you she's going to either go silent or she will tell you the truth and tell you about how she has experienced disrespect. People tend to take for granted the things that they have access to all the time. And so this is also why a lot of people have that saying where it's like, you don't know what you got until it's gone. And this is because, yeah, once you remove his access to you, then suddenly he realizes what he actually had. And so this is why we see a lot of pretty privileged women getting depressed in marriages because she's used to being the unaccessible girl. So remember, when you are less accessible, your pedestal is more likely to be higher because guys are kind of projecting certain qualities onto you. You know, you're kind of like just the fantasy. Um, you're kind of meeting his fantasy or whatever. But then when you are hyper visible or like when you're super close to a guy, so you're living together, you know, he's hearing you farting in the bathroom and hearing you go pee and stuff like that. And he's seeing you with no makeup or whatever, or like your hair's not done. He has seen you pregnant. He has seen you when you're swollen, when you gain 50 pounds, when you're 75 years old, all of that excitement it does gradually go away in the man, even though he won't admit it. This is what it is. Hence why they have the seven year itch, which is after he's been with you for seven years, he's most likely to cheat. This is also why pregnancy cheating is common. It's because he's got so much access to you to the point where he's like, hey, she's not gonna leave because you know she's pregnant by me. And then also same thing where the tables turn once you get married, once you um, make a big move where it's like you move into him with him, you get married to him. So now he has too much access to you. Or if he's been with you for 35 and 40 years, once again, too much access to the point where now he's most likely going to end up taking you for granted. And I know not all men are like this, but guess what? The exceptions don't make the rule. 
Also, a lot of guys stop trying after a while because they're like, hey, I got her now, so I'm going to stop trying to get promoted. I'm going to stop increasing my wealth. I can finally rest in my femininity. Oops, I mean, enjoy my marriage. Like, this is how a lot of guys are thinking on a subconscious level. Like I said, I really don't think that guys are just waking up in the morning, just like, oh, how can I screw over a woman today? I really don't think that that's what guys are thinking on average. I think that part of it is the the way that society is set up, patriarchy and stuff like that, internalized misogyny on both ends, the woman and the man, and it just ends up being to the point where the guy will stop putting in effort after a while, but then the woman she naturally will continue to put in effort. She will still be the caregiver for him when he gets sick, or she will still, you know, kind of help him to go to his doctor's appointments. She'll be scheduling his appointments for him, acting as his personal assistant and general manager. This is a dynamic I've noticed all the time. So what do you ladies think? Have you ever met a couple that has been married for decades? Do you come from a two-parent household like myself? And if so, do you like the way your mom was treated? Would you trade places with your mom? Would you have a marriage like how your mom or your grandma had? In fact, do you know of any marriages where the woman was treated like a princess the entire time for all 30 years? I'll wait. What do you ladies think? Let me know in the comments section and I'll talk to you next time. Stay pretty ladies.